When I was a kid, I thought a robot was some sort of a machine with a head, two legs, two feet and a body, and he could speak. A huge thing, intelligent machine. This kind of big metallic robot. My father would tell me stories of a robot helping the family at home, redoing your bed, cleaning the house. The robot had special functions, a very long telescopic arm, making possible to break everything with a huge force or to run extremely fast. He would engage in fights, fighting injustice. And then sometimes when I look, for example, of some of today's robots that we have developed, I can see elements of that, uh, of that initial vision of what a robot could be. People think about robots, probably they think of the classic Tin Man, a small humanoid robot. The robots are not necessarily anthropomorphic machines. Many of the robots that today we see deployed everywhere do not have any human shape. The robot is a machine that can perform a humanoid task. It should have motors, it should have some kind of brain, computer, and in this way supports humans by doing service tasks, by lifting objects or lifting patient limbs as a rehabilitation robot. The development of the Lokomart started in the 90s when my former colleagues realized that the manual training of people with gait impairments was too exhausting. So they invented a machine, a robotic machine, that helps the patients to recover from any kind of gait disorder, meaning that they cannot move and feel the legs anymore. And what they have to do is movement therapy. The legs of the patients are connected to the device via cuffs. And then the patient can walk on a treadmill while being guided by the robotic machine, the locoma. What you feel is the device that uh, applies a torque at the hip and at the knee and makes your leg move. The device applies a flexion at the two joints and move your leg forward. While Robotics technologies have been used for a while to help people regain capability lost due to an accident or to some pathology. The problem with these machines, with these robots, is that they are uh, bulky and uh, they require a technician to operate them and they are quite expensive. And so the access to this technology is limited to the people who have access and the money to afford uh, this type of, of technology. And so we asked ourselves, how can we take that technology and uh, make it more democratic so that people can have their rehabilitation robot in their home? And so there I saw an opportunity. NCCR stands for National Center of Competence in Research. When we started the NCCR program in robotics in 2010, we had a number of very good researchers in Switzerland who were tackling important problems in robotics, but were not coordinated in terms of research collaborations. I thought we could come together and brainstorm what together we could achieve in terms of big societal challenges with a time horizon of 12 years. 12 years, the longest program in Switzerland, to do intelligence robots for restoring, preserving, and assisting humans. That was our promise. Some of you are new to the NCCR, to just say, this is the last annual retreat. Uh, today we are going to see where we stand on the different research trends compared to what we wanted to do from the very beginning. And, and hopefully we will map out what remains to be done within the NCCR, but also in the future. We did found a great network of researchers which formulated the problems which helped us to evaluate the solutions. In research, we have often limitations which drive our research activities. The locomart was much too bulky. Patients had to go to the hospital. When they were released to go home, they could not take the device home, although in most cases, a continuation of the therapy would have been necessary. And that motivated us to develop something which is much more lightweight. My suit is like a pants. You can put on these pants and take them off if you don't need them. Wearable robotics is a particular type of robotics where the robot lives on the person. And these pants have little tendons which are attached to a backpack. 
the device knows if the person wants to stand up or if the leg swings. The idea is that the robot perceives what the person does and uh, acts on the person by, for example, supporting its actions or guiding or correcting its motion. It's like a muscle, a support of a muscle, but externally. Our research on the MySuit now helps many patients to better perform in their life and to walk instead of using a wheelchair. It's an alternative or an, a novelty, actually, to conventional therapy. In the NCCR, we um, tackled from the very beginning the challenges of wearable robots, and we met a number of challenges which remain today. We made progress, but remain challenges. One of the challenges is uh, making sure that the robot perceives what the human does. And so what the human does can be perceived by the motion of the human, but also by the muscular activity, by the neural activity of the person. To think about a person who lost uh, a part of the upper extremity, in particular at the level of the, of the forearm is able to reach for an object because can move the shoulder and the elbow, but there is no more a wrist and a hand, so the subject is not able to grasp by himself or herself an object. The idea of a hand prosthesis like the one we are working on is just to help this person reattaching an artificial version of the wrist and of the hand. When you have this new hand attached to your own body, the question is how you can control it. And what we try to do is to use the existing, still connected, uh, natural hand of the patient to get information then usable for the control of the prosthesis. Try to grasp the hand, the, the ball, and then hold it, lift it for five seconds. Two, three, four, five. So you can release it. So we have uh, the subjects doing different tasks while we are recording the muscular activity with sensors electrodes placed on the forearm of the subject while a camera is reconstructing the movement for the different fingers in a way that the new algorithm will be able to understand the real intention of the patient in a more natural way. Do it again, relax. What is missing and extremely important is sensory feedback. So the possibility to provide back information to the user's brain. Now, there is a very nice video uh, of a very uh, distinguished colleague of mine, Roland Johansson, showing that if you anesthetize the nerves of a healthy person and the person is not able to have the sensation of the position of the fingers, even lighting a match becomes impossible. Our skins are covered by thousands, millions of sensors per square centimeter. How can we pack the same amount of information into a flexible substrate that can comply, that can uh, bend? We have soft tissues, we have muscles which are contracting, we have other tissues which are wobbling around. To cope with the softness of the human body, we needed also soft material to easily adapt to shape changes of the body. So having sensors that can stay on the person, can read the physiological and neural data without being too invasive and being natural is a big challenge. The human body is a three-dimensional mobile structure. If we look at current devices we make for electronics today, look at your mobile phone, your computer, these are structures that are made of material that are flat and very rigid. So there are multiple strategies to design or engineer elasticity in material or devices that are a priori made with material that are not deformable. So one first example is actually a well-known example, is the telephone cord. The telephone cord has this sort of helicoidal structure, and yet it's made of material that are really not deformable. So by doing a three-dimensional coil, you're able to stretch reversibly and relax the overall structure, so having it completely elastic, and yet made of material which are not uh, deformable. The natural tactile sensors are extremely sophisticated and are embedded into, for example, our fingertip in a very effective way. 
So designing a device able to mimic and to substitute the same kind of performance is not easy. We decided to explore how to use liquid metal to form our stretchable conductors. Liquid metal are in a way the ultimate elastic conductor because they are very good electrical conductors and they also can deform on demand because of their liquid format. And so we explored how to manipulate liquid gallium to form the sensors that we wanted to develop to put onto the, the skin. In order to form the pattern, we can use a stencil mask and then literally spray the liquid metal at the surface of our sample. The spray coater uh, covers uh, uniformly liquid metal, the plastic mask. What I'm doing now is removing the plastic mask to obtain the desired pattern. One of the advantages of what Stefanie Lacour does is really the softness, the flexibility of air devices, which make them intrinsically, mechanically similar to the natural ones. This is very important because then they are easier to be integrated into a hand prosthesis or exoskeletons. You can use a similar technology to have soft conductors to design implants that will be sufficiently soft to conform the curvilinear structure of the nervous system. So the brain, for example, has a lot of curves and lots of corrugation at its surface. When we use the soft conductors uh, that we do in, in the lab, we can have devices and electrodes that are really nicely conforming and in good contact with the curved surface of the brain. We can do this for the brain, we can do this also for other portions of the nervous system, and in particular with the spinal cord. So here inside we can see a one-to-one -one scale of a monkey spine, and inside there is a soft bioelectronical interface that has been designed to deliver electrical stimulation. This is a biomimetic platform that aims to replicate the physiological motion of the spine. The main goal is to assess the physical properties of the implant and its performance over time, so that after repeating the cycle for thousands of times, it will be still able to deliver the expected electrical stimulation. Very early on, when we started the, the wearable robotics grand challenge, we realized that in order to make a difference, we have to team up with the neuroscientists because they understand how these wearable machines eventually will interact with the, with the brain. We were fortunate to have a colleague here at the PFL, Grégoire Courtine, who was interested in making persons with spinal cord injuries walk again. Over the past 30 years, various research groups have stimulated the spinal cord electrically to restore walking after paraplegia. And after intense rehabilitation, a select few individuals were able to take a few steps, but only with electrical stimulation. And nobody understood why. My team took the time to understand the science behind it, which allowed us to stimulate the spinal cord as the brain would do naturally. The overall goal was and is to stimulate the spinal cord with electrodes implanted, to reactivate in a natural way the different muscles related to locomotion, to allow people who are paralyzed to walk again. After several months of training with electrical stimulation, our three participants were able to activate their previously paralyzed muscles without electrical stimulation. One of the key moments, I would say, was uh, when I started walking hands-free on the treadmill. Of course, I had a lot of body weight support, but uh, really letting the bars go and do one, two, three steps without using my hand was uh, really crazy because uh, I, I just couldn't do it before and it wouldn't work without stimulation. In the NCCR, we teamed up to develop a family of robots that initially were very bulky and simply supported the person, gradually resulted into wearable devices like the Mayu suite. And eventually, the robot disappears and the technology is capable of reading the residual nervous signals and transmitting those nervous signals to stimulations after the spinal cord injury remain there without the robot being present in our daily life. So it's a very nice circle, if you like, of the robot disappearing and being embedded, integrated in the human. 
So there is a lot of research in robotics today that is not immediately visible. A lot of research in making those materials more compliant, a lot of research in making the intelligence disappear so that you don't even notice just the robot does the thing uh, naturally as you would expect from another living being. Animal is a quadruple robot. It is very strong to a point that it can actually lift several tens of kilos in addition to its own weight. The robot can operate on its own without any control by a human pilot. To do so, it has uh, multiple sensors that allow the robot to actually perceive the environment, within which it can identify all the obstacles and compute a trajectory through the obstacles in order to reach a certain goal. Today we're mostly testing the autonomy of our robots and also payloads of our robot that we use to inspect materials. And the target is that we can in the future inspect materials on the moon, so resources that could be used to build infrastructure or for life support on the moon. How can a robot see? Well, you start with darkness, black space, a three-dimensional space that has nothing inside. As soon as the camera captures the first frames, the first pixels, our algorithms, they are trying to encode this group of pixels so that you start grouping pixels together and say, all these pixels form a chair, all these pixels form a door. Basically trying to decode the situation in a similar way like uh, we humans do and, well, the goal is always to do better, even more than that. Robotics is the field that deals with how we can make a machine perceive, move and act in a desirable manner. Rescue teams in Switzerland, they have uh, special facilities that uh, consist in uh, villages with uh, collapsed or semi-collapsed buildings where they can do training operations, for example, against fire or simulate various type of disaster situations. And they invited us to go to these uh, training events. And when we looked around us, we noticed that there were no robots used by rescue teams. And so we said, that's where we can make a difference. How can we have robots that help out rescuers who go out in disaster areas, for example, after an earthquake, after big disasters like what happened in Fukushima? Legged robots that can go into unstructured and unexpected terrains, or even robots that can go into semi collapsed buildings and see if there is a person needing help so that the human rescuer eventually gets there. Robots that can not only walk but also go into flooded areas so they can be semi amphibious. For us, it's important to have um, a big variability of robots to test. That's already... We get a different viewpoint from a walking robot, which is about uh, knee height, and then the salamander, which is about at the height of your ankle. So every perspective has something different to tell you. But in the end, you do want these robots to realize that they are looking at the same scene from different perspectives. That's why we are working with a team of robots. A heterogeneous team of robots, ground robots and flying robots, that can collaborate together in order to best address a rescue situation. The goal is thinking about three, four drones, for example. You send them off to this disaster area, let's say a semi-collapsed building, and tell them to come back with the overview of the scene, such that someone who is on their way to the disaster area, they can assess the situation better. The information received by the drone could then be used by a legged search and rescue robot. There is a version of animal that features wheels in order to have a hybrid locomotion. So, so it can use the long moving wheels in order to climb the stairs and once it's on a flat terrain, it can then reactivate the wheels in order to roll on, on the terrain. Ground robot that can navigate through small openings to see where there are potential victims under rubble.
we actually decided to develop a rescue like robot within NCCR Robotics because the main uh, tool that is used in all search and rescue operations around the world is actually a dog because dogs can squeeze through narrow apertures and then reach a survivor or a victim very quickly, bringing water, bringing um, food, and especially bringing comfort. Of course, we are still far from uh, having a legged robot that uh, can achieve all the nice things that a dog can do in search and rescue, but it's just a matter of time. Certainly, nature is the main source of inspiration in order to uh, make this uh, dream a reality one day. When you compare today's robots with biological systems, independently of the shape and the function that the two have, you will see that robots tend to be brittle. At some point, there will be a part that breaks, that has to be replaced. At some point, they will get stuck. Instead, when you look at biological systems, they are amazingly resilient. Some time ago, I sent one of my students to film small flies that fly in very confined spaces. I was struck by the fact that these houseflies don't avoid all the objects, but they simply collide with the object, and their exoskeleton absorbs the collision and then bumps back, and the fly keeps flying. The gimbal drone is encapsulated by an outer spherical cage that can passively and freely rotate around the propellers. And this allowed us to fly this drone entirely autonomously, without visual perception, without complex intelligence, through a forest. Hitting the obstacles, hitting the trees, hitting the branches, the exoskeleton, just like the exoskeleton of insects, would simply absorb the collision, while the outer cage freely rotates around the inner propellers and the drone flies through the forest and exits at the far end of the forest. So biological systems are, in a sense, the holy grail of robotics. When you work in the lab developing your robot, you also understand how capable animals that we take inspirations from to develop these robots are. and you start to reconsider how that we should be maybe more humble. And, and we should think of our position in the planet with other animals in a different way. We are not uh, the emperors of this planet. We cannot simply do whatever we want. We are limited persons and uh, we can use technology uh, to overcome and make this environment and this world better. The goal is to have robots able to assist in um, difficult or even impossible tasks. It's immediately evident that uh, having robots to help out the, the rescuers, uh, give them more information or locate victims is already uh, very useful. But the possibilities of how robots can assist humans are endless. And I think it really helps to think about where we're putting humans in danger, where time is critical. In order to have an impact uh, with robots in society, you cannot simply do research. When we started the NCCR research program, I always made sure that we had a portfolio of projects funded by the program, prototypes that we thought could one day become products. And some of them have been extremely successful, meaning that they have uh, raised a lot of venture capital, they have hundreds of employees. Uh, one example is uh, Anybotics. They took the leg robot and they, they make a product that today can be used for inspection of uh, oil platforms where you need to send humans to do regular checks of, of the entire infrastructure. Flyability is a company that decided to commercialize the, our collision-resilient drone for inspection of industrial boilers or oil tankers. You can simply let the drone fly in at temperatures that maybe a human could not possibly withstand, do very rapidly the inspection because the drone can be in contact with the surface and then come back. Uh, 
at the moment, commercial drones rely on uh, lithium polymer batteries uh, that are the same batteries that are used by today's smartphones. The nice thing is that these batteries are very small, they are very lightweight, therefore you can have a very small drone, but the problem is that they only last for 20, 30 minutes. And so a drone that can only fly for such little time cannot uh, do much. By navigating faster, the drone can actually explore up to 10 times more an environment than it could by flying slower. So speed is the key here. That's why we actually started developing some scenarios that will allow my research team to actually push the limits of vision-based navigation. Drone racing features pilots that compete against one another in a race about time. The race consists of passing through a sequence of gates in a given order, and the one that reaches the finish line in the minimum time wins. And we invited the three best human pilots in the world. I'm Thomas Bivano. I'm Alex Vanover. And I'm Marvin Chen. This was the first AI versus human pilot race. And uh, what happened is actually very, very interesting. Both the AI drone and the human piloted drone were identical. Basically, they, if there was a difference, the main difference would come from the brain or from the algorithm. What I wanted to do is, I wanted to be able to remove these plates without the arms just like falling off. Yeah. At the beginning of a race, both the AI drone and the human drone are basically sitting on two podiums at the same distance from the first gate, and then when they hear the tone of start, they basically all lift from the podium. Human pilots control drones through a remote controller and a headset. This headset contains a display that receives the images from the camera on board the drone. The human brain analyzes the images and decides basically how to steer the drone through the racetrack. We let pilots to rehearse in the racing track for about a week to actually learn what is the fastest trajectories and the, the quickest tricks in order to win in a competition. And my team builds an internal three-dimensional map of uh, the environment in simulation. So in simulation, our AI attempts to fly random trajectories. It will find the one trajectory that will be uh, the fastest one. After the AI drone has taken off, it's completely autonomous use its own camera to make sure that it follows a trajectory accurately through all these waypoints. So by just using a camera, no GPS. Our drone actually outperformed the best of our world champions by half a second. Does it mean, therefore, that uh, machines are now uh, capable of flying better than human pilots? Absolutely not. Our uh, US champion, uh, Alex Vanover, when he realized that our drone was actually faster than him, he decided to actually not uh, be fast, but rather to wait for our drone in the middle of a gate. And then what happened is that our drone just uh, hit his drone and they both crashed onto the floor. However, uh, Alex Vanover was able to recover and therefore finish the race, although with a very slow speed, while our drone was completely broken on the floor. And this is something that actually is remarkable. So humans are actually able to recover. It will still take a lot of time to allow our machines to recover in any sort of failure. But we learned it can't recover. It can't do it. It just goes through. Human pilots are still uh, capable of doing uh, impressive and uh, agile maneuvers uh, in uh, very difficult environments for any robot. Okay, assess it. 
Robots can teach us how uh, incomplete we are. Uh, they provide the help to us. They can help us in overcoming our limitations, but they can also teach us a lot about our flexibility, intelligence, um, creativity. So we took kids and we said, do you see this robot? He must pass a test, a handwriting test. Could you help him passing the test? And we took children with actually handwriting difficulties themselves. Therapists told us, hmm, these kids have attention deficit. They cannot focus so long on an activity, 50 minutes without any problem. They wanted now to pass the test. So we build on what, we, what is called the teaching by learning effect or the protege effect. When you are responsible for the learning of someone, you engage yourself even more. We use a small humanoid robot called Nao. Kid take the tablet, he write um, hello, and, and give the tablet to, to the small humanoid, who takes the tablet and actually imitates the handwriting of the child. And the kid take the tablet back and say, oh no, no, it's not like that. And then he tried to improve the handwriting, but because Nao imitated, the handwriting of the child, the child is actually correcting himself. And then you see the light on the face of these kids. Wow! Educational robotics is about using robots in schools and other places for teaching and learning. An example of an educational robot, the very first one we developed in SCCR is Timio. Timio is a, is a small wheeled robot, approximately 10 centimeters in size, that is very expressive. It can uh, interact with the pupil by means of motion of sound, but also of light. The robot has very sophisticated processors using programming languages that today are used also in industry, so that we can train the students to program complex situations using the same robot. the educational instances in, in Switzerland were very interested in using these robots in their classroom. Today, we have already 80,000 of these robots deployed in classes across Switzerland. There is sometimes the fear that uh, the robot will be there or to change ways in which a school and, and education is done nowadays. But this is not the case. Anyone who sees a robot will see that, uh, uh, that this robot is never going to be able to replace a teacher. But it's there to offer new possibilities to the teacher. For example, to create interactions between students that would not be possible over a book, for example. If you go to school with a pen and a notebook, you can use your pen in many activities, you, but you will have one notebook for mathematics, one notebook for German, one notebook for history, and so on and so on. Could we do the same? Could we invent a robot that can be used for different learning activities by using different pieces of paper? Cellular came from the observation that many robots are basically designed from, for some specific learning activities. No school can afford a robot for a single learning activity. And so instead of programming the robot by connecting it to a computer and sending the program to the robot, you could simply draw situations uh, on a piece of paper. You would put the robot on this piece of paper. And the robot would read, thanks to the sensors and the artificial intelligence, what the environment is and would do different behaviors. One activity we designed is about the state of the matters. So we put nine cellulose on the table and we say that's an object composed of nine atoms. So now, now on which state we are? On the solid. The solid state. What do we expect from atoms in a solid state? Can you try, like, if the strong, the bond is strong, like, if you take one robot, it wants to stay with the, with the... And uh, because it's a solid, when you moved one of the atoms, 
The nine robots will move as a single object. And then if you input some energy, the color will change, indicating the energy level, and, it's, and the agitation of the other robots will increase. And at the end, you will have a loosely coupled set of atoms that represent a liquid. And if you put even more energy, at the end, it will be a gas. The other interesting novelty of, of cellular was that it would provide what we call in robotics haptic feedback. It means that as you touch the robot, the robot reacts to you by vibrations or by motion. This is a very intuitive way in which we interact with the environment and the, and the pupil can intuitively feel concepts like attraction of planets, for example, repulsion. Piaget, who was a pope of cognitive development, stressed the fact that most cognitive or mental operations first are experienced as physical manipulation and through trial and error get progressively internalized in some way into cognitive operations. So a rich feature of robots for learning mathematics and STEM is that they can bring some physicality into the learning. You can make it concrete, you can make the manipulation concrete. It's not the robot per se that will do that, it's the quality of the activity that kids will perform with this robot. A very cool, in my opinion, way of using robots into classrooms is to use them to teach things that we would otherwise not be able to teach. And one of these very key concepts that are super important because they are ubiquitous around us and still very difficult to teach and to understand is the concept of emergent behaviors, complex systems. If you think about it, life is something that emerges from the way atoms interact with each other, uh, the way birds fly in the sky. What are the single rules? What are the rules that control the behavior, you know, the interactions between agents? What is the effect that they produce? Now, this morning, it's the beginning of the fall, so you see hundreds of these birds, and they fly together. They have this distributed behavior where probably every bird tries to avoid a collision from his neighbor, but also try to be close enough from the neighbor to be able to, to fly long distances. And say, oh, there must be a leader, there must be a... No. This collective behavior of a swarm is something quite interesting to, to understand. And in modern computer science, it's very important. So the idea that a very complex patterns, very complex behaviors can emerge when there is no leader, no one deciding for everyone else. Small rules, simple rules, and spontaneously generate these complex patterns. This is a knowledge that is very useful to keep with ourselves uh, when we are looking at nature, for example, when we are looking at the many phenomena around us. We can also create activities that, for example, require different skills, different talents, and show how the union of these different capabilities and sensibilities brings forward better solutions. So robots can be used as a way to show the importance of diversity and the importance of seeing differences, not as something negative, but actually something positive. So in this sense, I think that educational robots can help uh, tackle and overcome gender differences, but also more broadly, all sorts of differences and uh, stereotypes that, uh, that affect our societies. If you enter any classroom of an engineering university program, you will see very few women. And the problem is even more serious for robotics. And the question is why? So that's clearly a, a problem. One thing I've observed during the 12 years of the NCCR was uh, the enthusiasm that people have had to share their work and share their work with a very large public. And this gave the opportunity also for the public to see that research in robotics and research in general can be conducted by women and men equally. And so I think that's, uh, I think, an important message that uh, we're able to, to convey through. Because it means that by empowering teachers, also primary school teachers are incidentally typically women. So by empowering them to teach educational robotics, we are actually improving the perception that girls have in robotics and therefore mitigating very effectively possibly the biases that, uh, that they have. I do hope that, you know, when 
this generation that is being taught today and they're playing with moving platforms that they can program and they can see how code can become something that uh, something creative then i think that we are also building the next generation of engineers uh, that they're going to go into their engineering degrees and they're not going to be like one in 50 that i was you know over the past 12 years, we have been developing a number of robots and tackling scientific and technological challenges. But uh, also what we've done is that we've created a community in Switzerland that brings together experienced people like professors and young researchers, PhD students, postdocs, and even students, master students. The science we did in the NCCR was done by young researchers, by master students, by PhD students, in this way, we are educating a new generation of scientists. It's um, probably one of the outcomes that is less visible, but is, I think, one of those outcomes that will leave long-lasting uh, effects in the future generation of professors, uh, entrepreneurs and uh, students. The main advantage of NCCR Robotics has been uh, to create a consortium of different researchers coming from different fields all together. We've had the opportunity to expose the research we're doing to many groups and listen to the research from many other groups. And I think one very strong added value of the NCCR is the collaboration that emerged from the, the various group because we, we could actually think of application that as individual groups we could not anticipate. The NCCR Robotics uh, was extremely important for me because at the very end, during the last four years, uh, helped me starting the third ARM project. A project which is extremely futuristic and scientifically challenging. We are intrinsically designed to control two arms uh, with our brain. Can we control more than two? Robots and robotics literally come out of the imagination of humans. It's something that evokes ideas in, into us, so based on what we've read, based on what we've seen in movies. Everybody or many people dreams of flying. How could a human become a drone and fly with her own body as if she was a drone? At the same time, with every robot that we create and that we bring to people, we also affect back their perception and their expectations and their ideas about robots. So I see this process of mutual influencing between human imagination and the capabilities of a robotics engineer as a very interesting co-creation process. And uh, I'm very curious to see what, uh, what we together will be able to invent uh, in the robotics in the coming years. The cost of not continuing robotics research is uh, devastating if you think about where we can go. If we don't continue research on robotics, others will do. And those who will do it might not have the same intention as we do. So if we want to have robotics for the good of the society, we better keep some energy invested in designing robots and robotic activities that serve the good of humanity. Thank you.